Let me begin by thanking the alumni association of TIFR for this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, the talk, again, I, I see a lot of experts in the audience, so the talk is not supposed to be for them, so the talk is supposed to be for them. So, uh, the level would be something which is for a general public talk. So, we will get to expert questions towards the end of the talk. So, the title is the, that the discovery of gravitational waves was the top scientific breakthrough of 2016. And what I basically want to do in this particular talk is lead you to why it is considered the top breakthrough of last year. My story begins almost 340 years back with this great book by Newton, The Principia, something which we learned in school about Newton's mechanics and Newton's gravity, where Newton realized that mass is a measure of both inertia and the source of gravity. He also gave us what we call as the inverse square law of gravitation, where this is something which we learn in our school. And then this particular theory was a successful theory for about 200 years because it helped us understand the motions of apples, tides, moon, planets, comets, name it. But this is an instantaneous action at a distance theory. And therefore, in this particular theory, gravitation propagates with infinite velocity. Moreover, this experimentally known fact that all bodies fall similarly in a uniform gravitational field, which if you analyze, basically means there is uh, equality of inertial mass and gravitational mass. This remarkable coincidence has no fundamental role in Newtonian gravity. 1905, Einstein gave a special theory of relativity as a consequence of which we know that no interaction can propagate faster than the speed of light. Therefore, in 1907, when Einstein was writing a review of special theory of relativity, he realized that Newtonian gravity was in conflict with the principle of special relativity. And then, using what he called the happiest thought in his life, the happiest thought being that for an observer falling freely, there exists, at least in his immediate surroundings, no gravitational field. It's as if the gravitational field can be transformed away if you're in a freely falling frame. This he converted into an uh, equivalence principle, and this was the lodestone which he used to create general theory of relativity, which is Einstein's relativistic theory of gravity. Everybody agrees that this theory is the epitome of mathematical elegance, conceptual depth, and importantly, of observational success. And on 25th November 2015, this remarkable theory <coughs> celebrated its centenary. According to Einstein, gravitation is synonymous with space-time geometry and mathematically described by the curvature or the distortion of space-time. Gravity is described by Einstein's equations, and these equations are a fairly complicated system of 10 nonlinear partial differential equations. This places the one equation which describes gravity in Newtonian theory. Though a uniform gravitational field can be transformed away, there is of course physical effects of gravitational field, and physically one knows that it's the tidal effect by which gravity manifests itself. For instance, if in a, you have a, two bodies which are falling towards the earth, the gravitational field is not uniform, so therefore the body closer to the earth would fall faster and therefore if you monitored the separation between them, the separation would increase. If you put for example two bodies horizontally separated, they will both fall towards the center of the earth and again monitoring the separation essentially tells you that you are in a real gravitational field and not in an accelerated frame. This is going to be important for what I will say later, so keep this in mind. So if you have any relativistic theory of gravitation, like the general theory of relativity, it has to be consistent with the principle of special relativity. Therefore, the effect of gravity cannot be transmitted faster than light. So if the gravitational field of an object changes, these changes propagate through space and take a finite time to reach other objects. Therefore, we have the possibility of gravitational waves from Einstein's equations 
just as we have electromagnetic waves from Maxwell's equations. So one can say that gravitational waves are nothing else but freely propagating oscillations of the gravitational field. And because physically gravity manifests as a tidal effect, we can say gravitational waves are oscillating tidal gravitational fields which propagate out from the source. If you analyze the equations of gravitational waves in the general theory of relativity, one can show that this tidal force field is oriented either in the form of a plus or in the form of a cross. And therefore, if gravitational waves are incident normally on a ring of particles, they will be tidally stretched and squeezed in an oscillatory time dependent manner. So if you want to detect gravitational waves, you should really measure the amount of squeeze it induces. And to quantify it, we introduce the notion of a gravity wave strain. If you have two test particles which are initially separated by a distance L, if a gravity wave signal passing through changes the separation by delta L, as shown in this particular picture, picture you take the ratio of delta L by L. This is a strain. And this represents the quantitative effect of a gravitational wave. Gravitational waves were predicted by Einstein in 1916, just six months after he gave his theory, as an important consequence of general relativity using linearized form of general relativity. Because I told you, gravity is a very complex theory, and therefore he linearized his equations. He derived what we call today as the quarter pole formula in 1918, where you say that the gravitational effect is given by this particular formula, where r is the distance from the source, g the Newton's constants, c the speed of light, and i mean you, the quarter pole moment of this particular source, the dots refer to time derivatives, this means you take the second time derivative of the quarter pole moment. Once you know what the gravitational perturbation is, it determines what the metric is, what the spatial separations are, what the time intervals are, so you can calculate what is the strain which is caused by a gravitational wave. So if you take a binary system which is made up of two stars going around each other, you can estimate what the strain is. And the strain is given by a very simple formula of the following kind, where m is the mass of the source, r the distance from the source, and v a typical velocity. So if you apply this to a system made up of two cars put together by separated by about 2 meters, rotating let's say at about 1000 hertz and calculate what is the associated strain, that strain comes out to be a very small quantity of the order of about 10 raised to minus 39. And therefore Einstein observed that this must have a practically vanishing value in all conceivable situations and like a competent patent clerk that he was, he rightly assessed that such ripples would be vanishingly small and nearly impossible to detect. And therefore, even today we don't have a Hertz experiment for gravitational waves. And the reason is connected to two fundamental differences between electromagnetism and gravitation. One thing is the weakness of the gravitational interaction by a factor of 10 raised to 39. And the fact that you don't have dipole radiation as you have in electromagnetism, the leading order radiation is quadrupolar. And if you remember your basic physics, once you go to a higher multiple, you go down by a factor of c squared. Therefore, if you try to convert mechanical energy to gravitational radiation, unless you have strong fields and unless you are at relativistic velocities, the efficiency is very small. And even if you have a gravitational wave, the effect on any potential de detector is going to be very, very feeble. And therefore, you cannot have laboratory sources. The likely sources are only signals which are produced by astrophysical systems where you can have large masses which can be accelerating very strongly. What are the properties of gravitational waves if you analyze Einstein's theory? So what you will realize is that in general relativity, gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. They are also transverse and they have two states of polarization. Just as you have two states of linear polarization, here you also you have two states of polarizations which are technically referred to as the plus and the cross. They carry away energy, angular momentum and linear momentum from the system. And just as accelerated charges produce electromagnetic waves, accelerated motion of masses produce gravitational waves. But unlike electromagnetic waves, gravitational waves propagate essentially unperturbed through space because they interact very weakly with matter. Unlike electromagnetic waves, the effect is non-linear because the gravitational wave energy 
density itself will have a gravitational effect. So unlike linear electromagnetics, uh, electromagnetism, in general relativity you have to deal with nonlinear effects. The important point is that the properties of gravitational waves will be different if you have a different theory of gravity and therefore once you detect gravitational waves, if you can study the properties of those gravitational waves, it offers you a way to test Einstein's gravity itself. Even though Einstein predicted gravitational waves and gave the quadrupole formula in 1980, over the next 50 years, there was a lot of confusion about gravitational waves. For example, Eddington pointed out that his derivation actually doesn't apply to self-gravitating systems and mentioned that if you analyze those equations, gravity waves seems to propagate at any speed which you can imagine. Einstein himself was confused. In 1936, he wrote to Bond, for example, Together with a young collaborator, I arrived at the interesting result that gravitational waves do not exist. There were many other inconsistent results during this particular time. And the basic doubt was, are gravity waves physical or they are just coordinate artifacts in Einstein's theory? This was really resolved in a very important conference in 1957, which was called the Chapel Hill Conference, in the work of Felix Pirani and Herman Bondi. So in this particular conference, the physicality of gravitational wave was resolved and in a sense, the quest for gravitation wave detection was really born because Pirani emphasized that the tidal effect of gravitational waves is unambiguous and given mathematically by the geodesic deviation equation. He and Bondi gave a physical argument about why gravitational waves should transfer energy. They said, suppose you have a rod on which you put two washers and these washers can sort of move on this particular rod. Because of this tidal force, these rings will move up and down and because of the friction, they could heat a mechanical kind of system. So by using gravitational waves, you can heat a mechanical system. So obviously, gravitational waves must carry energy. In this particular meeting, Joe Weber and John Wheeler were there in this particular meeting and this is what motivated Joe Weber to actually start building a gravity wave detector, which he did in 1960. In 1969, he even made a claim for gravity wave detection and for many years insisted that he was seeing gravitational waves. Unfortunately, other experimenters, when they tried to reproduce his result, they could not confirm his detection. In a sense, many of the things which we do today was, came from Joe Weber. So in a sense, we consider him as the tragic pioneer of our subject. It took another 50 years before the instrument which really made the discovery came into being. But in those 50 years, a lot of things happened which are important for the rest of the story. For instance, in the 1960s, the great astrophysicist Chandrasekhar attacked the radiation reaction problem. He asked the question, how does the emission of gravitational wave affect a system if it is self-gravitating? He basically showed that the energy and angular momentum which are radiated as gravitational waves was correctly balanced by the loss of mechanical energy and angular momentum and his work gave astrophysicists confidence that GR was physically reasonable and well behaved. 1932 when the neutron was discovered, just a year after that, Bade and Zivicki hypothesized the existence of stars composed of neutrons as possible end states of a supernova explosion. This is what they call as neutron stars. 1939, Oppenheimer and Volkov, they published a theory of these neutron stars and showed that they would be stars as massive as the sun, roughly, but the radius would be very, very small, of the order of about 10 kilometers. If you look at the equations of general relativity and some nuclear physics, you can determine structure of these neutron stars. And today, we know that their masses cannot be more than three solar masses. But nobody knew how to look for neutron stars, but nature gave us a hand. Because in 1967, objects called pulsars were discovered by Jocelyn Bell and Tony Hewish. And then analysis of these pulses essentially showed that these pulsars are nothing else but rotating neutron stars. So what pulsars are, are celestial, uh, celestial lighthouses. So they are stars on which somebody has put a lighthouse. And that lighthouse is what we see as pulsars. In a sense, in the heavens, we have accurate clocks, celestial clocks. And using these celestial clocks, you can make measurements 
which tell you something more about the general theory of relativity as I will show you later. Another important thing was the existence of black holes itself, objects from which nothing can come out. Even light cannot come from these particular objects. These objects have what we call as a one-way surface from which you can go one way, that means you can go inside, but you cannot come out. So these are objects in which things can fall in, but nothing can come out. They are typically characterized by, again, a radius, which we call the Schwarzschild radius, is given by this particular formula. And for a star like the Sun, the typical value is about 3 kilometers. If a star has a larger mass, the Schwarzschild radius or its horizon would be even larger. Again, how are you going to look for these black holes? You know, is there some way you can think that black holes are really physical objects? Then what happened is that in 1963, objects like quasars were discovered. These were distant objects, they were powerfully radiating objects, and soon people realized that standard processes would not explain their energy output, they had to be associated with black holes. And this really led to the birth of relativistic astrophysics, and this is Carl Schwarzschild who gave the first solution of gravity of, of, for black holes, Roy Kerr who talked about rotating black holes, and many other people who <coughs> contributed to our understanding of black holes. But in this particular story, there is Professor Vishweshwara who made a remarkable contribution. For example, in the 1970, he proved that Schwarzschild black holes are really stable objects. So really, in nature, such objects could sort of really exist. And even though nothing can really come out of a black hole, these black holes are like bells. If you perturb them, if you hit them by any perturbation, then they ring down. And those ring down modes, the dying nodes of these uh, objects, which are today called the quasi-normal modes, this is how you can see a definitive signature of these particular black holes. Again, this was his work in 1970, but later on in 71, William Press and later Detweiler and Chandrasekhar essentially looked at this in much more detail. And today, for example, we know what are the heartbeats of a Schwarzschild black hole. We can characterize the quasi-normal modes. And the amazing thing is the quasi-normal modes are characterized for Schwarzschild black holes only by their mass and for the rotating black holes by their mass and angular momentum. A watershed event in the story of gravitational waves is the discovery of this object which we call the binary pulsar 1913 plus 16. So in 1974, Hulse who was a graduate student of Taylor, they basically discovered a pulsar system and analysis basically showed that this pulsar system wasn't a binary system. Now, if this system is in a binary, then it has a time-varying quarter pole moment, and therefore if general relativity is right, the system must emit gravitational waves, spiral inwards, rather than move on a fixed elliptical orbit, because if it didn't lose energy, it will be moving on a fixed orbit. And 30 years of observations of this remarkable object really shows that if you use Einstein's theory, Einstein's quarter pole formula, what you have is this uh, fixed line, and what you see as dots here are the observations which the which you can make about how the orbit is changing with respect to time. So essentially, in 1982, you have a test for general theory of relativity, which basically said that the radiation radiation was really being emitted by this particular system. In 1993, Hulse and Taylor were given the Nobel Prize for the discovery of, not for gravitation radiation, but for the discovery of this particular object, because this discovery opened possibilities for studying gravitation. Was this the only object? No. After that, many other binary pulsars have been sort of discovered. The most remarkable of them has, has, is a system which is called the double pulsar, where you have both systems pulsar pulsing in the binary system. So you can see that we have come to a particular stage in the 1990s and then you sort of suddenly sort of realize that if you use the water pool formula and you know how much radiation is emitted per year, you can estimate that in 300 million years this binary pulsar will actually coalesce. What does that mean? It means that in the universe there are binary neutron stars which are emitting neutron, uh, neutron gravitational waves 
they exist for 100 million years, which is much smaller than the age of the universe, and then they will collapse spectacularly. In the, and this is the important thing that in the bandwidth in which you can build sensitive detectors, what detectors are, I will say in a moment, these detectors, these, in, in, uh, gra in, uh, these systems are really going to coalesce. So, this system is inspiring, but eventually it will coalesce, and that coalescence is what we will hope to see if we build a detector which is sensitive at that particular frequency. So, the important point is, as I told you, after the bar detector, in the 50 years, Essentially, we realize that the late in spiral and merger epochs of compact binaries of neutron stars are of black holes. They provide strong sources of gravitational waves for detectors like LIGO and Virgo in the sensitive bandwidth, and that bandwidth is somewhere, somewhere between 10 hertz to 10, about 10 kilohertz. Because of the fact that they are almost about to coalesce, the systems are highly relativistic. If you look at the binary system, which Taylor discovered, Hans and Taylor discovered, they are not very relativistic. The V by C is of the order of 10 raised to minus 4. But when they are about to coalesce, they are highly relativistic. And by simple physical argument, you can know what the waveform should look like. The waveform is basically a chirp. Chirp means its amplitude and frequency must increase with time. This just comes from basic physics. Because of the fact that it is inspiring inwards, it is coming closer and closer. Therefore, the frequency should increase with respect to time. And because it is coming into a strong region of gravity, the amplitude also increases with respect to time. So, essentially, this is a signature that if you have an inspiring binary system, you should see something like this. So, if you had a binary neutron system in the nearest cluster of galaxies, you can try to estimate what is the strain it will induce on a detector on the Earth. And now the number is much smaller than the 10 to minus 39 for lab sources. So if you can build an inter interferometer which is let's say a kilometer long, you really have to measure a displacement which is about 10 to minus 18 meters. So if you really want to detect gravitational waves, you really have to measure the small strain and this very very small displacement. The important point is that if you have a device which is very big, the displacement which you measure, which you have to measure, which should be bigger. Just to contrast, the famous experiment of Michelson and Morley for special relativity corresponds to a measurement of about 10 to minus 9 meters. So you can see it's almost which we have to sort of scale to detect gravitational waves. The strain amplitude, as I had shown you in the quadrupole formula, falls as the distance. It is the amplitude and not the flux. So, if you can build an instrument which is n, ten times, sorry, n times more sensitive, you can see n times far, which means you can see n cube times because the volume will scale as n cube, and therefore, roughly, you can say that you can see n cube number of events. So, the important point is that. The higher the sensitivity, higher the number of events you can try to see and therefore your chances of what you are going to see will sort of go up. And this is really the strategy which was adopted by the people who proposed the LIGO, the LIGO project. The instrument which made the discovery is what we call today as advanced LIGO. But when they built that project or when they made the project itself, they decided that they should go in two steps. First build an initial LIGO. And this initial LIGO was actually to prove that the proof of principle that this experiment will really work. And then try to go to an instrument which will be 10 times more sensitive and then try to look for gravitational waves. And as you see, spectacularly, that the strategy really worked. Now, what is this uh, basic uh, strategy which we use to detect gravitational waves? So you really want to measure a very small displacement and as everybody uh, who knows, uh, has done some physics will know that basically this is done by laser interferometer. So what is shown here is a cartoon of what is meant by a laser interferometer. Here there is a laser, there is a uh, beam splitter, there are two mirrors here. Uh, the light goes, reflects, comes back and then you try to interfere it. And if these two waves interfere destructively, there is no light. But if it, if the path length changes, then the fin system will basically change 
and that is what you try to look for. So you basically try to monitor this fringe system and the important point is that if gravitational waves fall on this particular system, there will be a tidal distortion. One arm will be squeezed, one will sort of elongate and therefore because the path length changes, you would really see a deflection in the uh, a kind of signal in the uh, output port. So essentially, this is the basic principle which you use. So in a sense, you use the interferometer mirrors as test pass. The passage of the gravitational wave induces differential arm length change. This change will be proportional to the gravity wave strain amplitude. And what you do is convert it into power fluctuations and measure these power fluctuations by using a photodiode. Just to give you an idea of how small the 10 raised to minus 19 advanced LIGO sensitivity is, let's begin with 1 meter. You cut it down, you sort of look down on it by a factor of 10,000. You get to the level, let's say, of human hair. Divided by a factor of 100, you get to the wavelength of light. Go down a factor of 10,000, you get to atomic dimensions. Another 100,000 to proton or the nuclear dimensions. And what we are trying to measure is something 10,000 10, times smaller. So no wonder that it took 100 years because when Einstein was thinking about what the effect is, the technology was not really there to make such sensitive measurements. So I begin with a simple Michelson interferometer, which I showed you. A simple Michelson meter, uh, interferometer a few kilometers long, as you will see, is not sensitive enough to really make the measurement which we really need. So what we really do is try to increase the interaction time of the gravitational wave with the light by using what is called as a fabry pivot cavity. You make the light bounce 100 times so that in a sense the optical path length of the interferometer is 100 times what you originally had. So you have effectively have a 100 kilometer long interferometer. Then what you have to do is that you have to sense the separation between these fringes very accurately and for that you really need large power into this particular cavity. So you do what is called as power recycling. All the power which would have been wasted by going back to the laser is sent back into the instrument and you do what is called as power recycling. And then finally, you also do something which is called signal recycling so that the sensitivity of the interferometer can be tuned suitably. Finally, as I told you, you use photo detectors and by using these photo detectors, essentially you can measure not just the fringe separation, you can measure 10 raised to minus 11th of a fringe. So in a sense, as I keep emphasizing, the interferometer is acting like a transducer, converting the gravity wave to a photo current, which is proportional to the strain amplitude. And that is how, by this measurement, you are essentially measuring the strain amplitude caused by the gravitational wave on a detector on the Earth. But the point is that though you are building a very sensitive detector, this detector is buffeted but by many other sources of noise. So you really need to beat a number of fundamental and technical noise sources which will affect the measurement at these, lengths, uh, these minute uh, displacement which you want to sort of measure. For instance, at the high frequencies, you really try to improve your sensitivity by using higher laser power. At the mid frequencies, you basically use lower thermal noise, uh, you know, uh, mirrors and the basic problem is at the low frequencies the seismic activity of the earth is very very large. So you essentially have to make sure that the instrument is on a shock absorber which will sort of remove the uh, displacement by almost factors of 10 raised to 10. <coughs> so you can seismically isolate the system by very high quality seismic you know, system. For example, you have a multiple uh, pendula, high quality you know, fibers to really uh, pull down the seismic vibration by factors of 10 raised to 7. And then you put it on a, a seismic isolation platform by another factors of 3. And all this really has been sort of done. And this was really what was really learned by setting up the initial instrument and then going on to the advanced instrument. So essentially you have uh, instrumentation science 
at the frontiers of physics fundamental limits and in a sense our interest in this particular experiment and having such an activity in India is basically not just the astronomy which is of course important but the fact that it is going to give us access to technology which really is not beatable today. Now, when the LIGO project was sanctioned, people realized that since you are trying to measure something very, very minute, if you really had a signal only at one particular site, you would not be sure whether it was caused by some local disturbance or by an astrophysical source. So it was decided that to be sure, you better have another observatory as far away in the US as you could put and therefore the project was really conceived with an <coughs> observatory at Hanford and another observatory at Livingston. The distance about, is about 3000 uh, kilometers and therefore if you saw a signal here within the light travel time you should be able to see that signal even in this other observatory only then you would believe that you are seeing something astrophysical. The Europeans, the Italians and the French have their own detector at a place called Cassina. This is a 3 kilometer long detector and this again is one of the bigger detectors and therefore the global large detectors essentially is the LIGO Virgo uh, network. I would also like to mention that in addition to having two sites, the original LIGO project had two detectors in the same beam tube basically because again as I said they wanted to be doubly doubly sure. So originally they had two sites and three detectors and this is important for the LIGO India project which I am going to talk about later. So keep this in mind. So we have a remarkable experiment, an experiment which is completely unforgiving but this was complemented by pro progress in theory which came from analyzing Einstein's general theory of relativity and building on that particular theory a very remarkable data analysis infrastructure using all the inputs coming from general theory of relativity. The reason is basically because gravitational waves are very weak signals even from these black hole sources or neutron star sources and they are completely buried in the large noise of the detector. So the situation is somewhat like this. The detector output is what you see here and what you see in blue is actually the signal which is buried in it. But if you talk to your engineering friends, they basically will tell you that there is a technique called match filtering. If you know what you are looking for, you can detect it even if the noise is much larger. So you can not only detect such a signal, you can also estimate what are the parameters of this particular signal and in practical life you use it. For example, if you are on Coloba and your friend suddenly calls you, even among that noise, your brain can match the pattern and you can know that there is somebody whom you know calling you. A mother can pick up her child's cry in a, in a crowded uh, train for example. This is essentially a more sophisticated version of that, implementation of that. So what is shown in this particular animation is that if you do the correlation between, if you know what you are sort of looking for, and you try to correlate what you are looking for by running it through the shown on this is that I am just correlating this and when the phase matches exactly you will see that it will pick up this particular correlation. So essentially you correlate a known signal with the noisy data and obviously if you lose phase information here then obviously the correlation will not be very strong. So the important point is that if you want to succeed using match filtering to detect gravitational waves, you really need an accurate model of the signal and that you do by using general theory of relativity. And therefore when the LIGO project was funded, uh, Kip Thorne and Caltech basically realized that you really will need to model gravitational waves much more accurately than what was sort of known till, that, till then. And if you really look, analyze what really you want to do, there is an early in spiral phase, then there is a merger phase, and then there is a ring down. As the associates sort of mentioned, my basic research in, in collaboration with my colleagues in France essentially was using Einstein's equations, iterating into higher orders of nonlinearity and higher orders of V by C to calculate this as accurately as possible. For example, today 
we can go beyond the quadruple formula by factors of v by c raised to 7. And that was basically required to build this data uh, analysis infrastructure. This is a very complicated thing which cannot be done by analytical methods and unless numerical relativity came in 2005, we could not calculate this very accurately. But then, as I mentioned to you, the 1970 work of Vishweshara essentially tells us how once the dynamical phase is over, how the black hole will essentially ring down. So this is something again which we knew very well by earlier work on perturbations of black holes. And essentially the Indian contribution which really started somewhere around 1990 in this global effort for detecting gravitational waves really was on these two significant fronts. One was this work on source modeling at the Raman Institute in a group around me in collaboration with my French colleagues and an activity on gravity wave data analysis and in, at Ayuka under my distinguished colleague Sanjeev Bharatna. The good thing was that the students and postdocs from our groups essentially spent time in the gravity wave groups abroad. They came back to faculty positions and they really are the current generation leaders of gravity wave research in India and essentially their activities are in source modeling and in data analysis. The important point is that many of these groups contributed to the analysis of the discovery paper and as you know about 37 of them are authors on this discovery paper and this is the team and as you can see it's a fairly young kind of team and I'm very proud of all of them. So now let's come to the discovery itself, the discovery of gravitational waves. This actually, this really belongs to a full collaboration, the LIGO scientific collaboration to which uh, Indigo belongs and the Virgo collaboration. So what is shown in the next slide is basically the statement that on September 14, just four days before our observation run was about to begin, so we are not even ready to begin, the two observatories detected a coincident gravity wave signal. The signals arrived at the two detectors within seven milliseconds and it had a very high signal to noise ratio as you will see in the next slide. So what is shown here is an audio clip which basically shows what you see as the hum is the normal noise in the detector but suddenly you see a wrapping up of frequency and the intensity is sort of going up and then you basically see very similar patterns in both the laboratories and if you really start analyzing it you basically realize that this is the Hanford signal and the Livingston signal in blue and if you shift it by that 7 milliseconds essentially they, point, they fall on each other which really means you are looking at the same source. So this is the basic observed data and as I told you from the observed data which means the frequency, the way the frequency increases with respect to time, you can calculate a combination of the binary masses which is called as the chirp mass and most of the analysis begins by using this particular object to do the analysis. As I told you, we have complete knowledge of what the expected signal is. So here I will sort of go a little uh, fast. Essentially, as I told you, we have constructed this data analysis infrastructure. So essentially, once we have a signal, we try to estimate what the parameters of this particular signal are. And with certain confidence limit, we can say that the parameters of the signal is such and such. Then using those parameters, we use numerical relativity and reconstruct what Einstein's equation tell us about that particular signal. So that is what I call here as expected signals. So this is the observed data. From the observed data, we extracted our parameters. Then using those parameters, we have reconstructed the signal. And then when you subtract one from the other, what is left is essentially noise. So this is why we basically say that our data is consistent our signal is consistent with the coalescence of two black holes. And what you see here at the end is essentially that ring down which I was sort of mentioning, telling you about. The important point is that this particular signal did not re require any match filtering. On a simple frequency times you really saw a strong signal. But not all sources would have strong signal to noise ratio and before that, I just want to show so what we are really seeing are two binaries going around each other. 
1.3 billion years ago, they essentially coalesced. Then the gravitational waves from them pass through the Earth, pass through the universe. Essentially, as I said, since they don't get affected by all the matter in between, they essentially reach the Earth, fall on the Earth. And fortunately, they don't wiggle it as much as it's shown in this particular diagram. But our detector definitely wiggled, and that is essentially what we basically measured. Now, this is another technical thing. The basic thing is how confident we are that this is a signal and not something which is created by the noise. So as I told you, to actually detect this particular signal, we have to do match filtering, and that match filtering really requires constructing templates over a large value of masses, etc. And we use roughly like 250,000 waveform templates to really do this particular search. But then we have only one particular event. So how do we know that this is a significant event and not created by noise? So what is really done is we take the two uh, the data from the two detectors and put them together and then slide them relative to each other by about 100 milliseconds. Now, if we split them by 100 milliseconds, if you see any coincidences, that coincidences should be only random because if it's a real astrophysical signal, it had to come within that 10 milliseconds. So therefore, by the synthetic process, you can create roughly a million years worth of data. And then we try to see in how many of those events basically will have such a high signal to noise ratio. And then our answer is that such a signal will only be seen 1 in 203,000 years. And that is the reason we say that it is a signal which we are confident about at Phi Sigma level. Because of our infrastructure, we can reconstruct the parameters of the system which really created this event. We have the primary black hole, the secondary black hole, the primary, uh, primary black hole. And what you see here are the masses with 90% confidence limit and the error bars on them. We can also calculate by using Einstein's theory what the black hole mass and black hole spin should be, how far it is, and by using a standard cosmology, convert this distance into a cosmological redshift. So if you add these two numbers, you basically see that this addition is larger than this. And what it really therefore tells us is that energy corresponding to three solar masses was radiated as gravitational wave in almost about 0.1 second. So it corresponds to a very high power emission of about 10 raised to 49 watts. It is more than the luminosity of all the stars in the universe for that brief time. So we are really looking at very powerful astrophysical sources. Was this the only event we saw in our observational run? No. On 26 December, we saw another event. But this time, we could not pick it up on the time frequency plot because the signal to noise ratio it was sort of smaller. It was not 24, but somewhere like 30. But when we did match filtering, very clearly in the noisy data, we could pick out this particular signal. So this again tells us why you know match filtering is really going to be sort of important. And therefore, if you try to analyze different kinds of sources, we are going to be needing both the first method where you can really see it explicitly in the time frequency plot, and the other ones where you have to do match filtering. So, essentially, during the first run, we had these two events. We also had one more event, which we are not confident about at Phi Sigma, and therefore we only call it a possible LIGO Virgo trigger. But our analysis essentially tells us that it is most likely to be a binary system rather than something which is created on the Earth. And if you really look at, this is the sensitivity uh, uh, graph of the injector, Depending on the mass, the, you either pick the detect the system when it is about to merge or when it is in spiraling and merging. So the first system was merging in the detector bandwidth. The December event was in spiraling. And for such systems, if the mass is smaller, their merger would be outside this bandwidth also. So for example, if you have a neutron star, neutron star system, it will not merge in the detector bandwidth, but outside that. Already with the first test, we know that general relativity has been tested by many ways, by solar system tests. 
And you can ask the following question. Since you are looking at a black hole system and there are stronger gravitational fields, can you say something about the correctness of Einstein's general theory of relativity? So as I told you, when you subtract the uh, theoretical prediction from the data, we get something consistent with the noise. So obviously it means at that particular level Einstein's theory is good. We can calculate the final mass and spin by looking at the early in spiral part and the later post in spiral parts and show that they are in agreement. Again, this shows that Einstein's theory in going from in spiral to the ring down is really the correct theory. Einstein's quarter mole formula is corrected by many, many corrections. Those corrections are called post Newtonian coefficients. We can test we can test for the correctness of those coefficients and again when we do such tests we find that they are consistent with Einstein's prediction. And again as I told you the last part of the signal should be this ring down which we should have predicted. Though we cannot be categorical that we have shown that the you know what the parameters of the ring down are. We know that the ring down part is consistent with what Vishweshwara had originally said. Is gravity propagated by a massive particle, particle or a massless particle? If it is pr propagated by a massive particle, there are additional propagation effects which come in the phasing formula and one can try to put limits on that by using these uh, observations. So it's interesting that after 100 years when we make this detection and we talk about Einstein's prediction of gravitational waves, Einstein again turns out to be sort of right. Up till now, gravitational waves, sorry, binary black hole masses were known from X-ray studies, but typically they were smaller than about 20 solar masses. It's very amazing that after the first discovery itself, is that even with the first discovery already the initial mass systems, the final mass system, the masses are much much higher than what we had already thought. So obviously with the first discovery we are really looking at a new class of objects in the universe. So the gravity wave discovery extends the observed mass range of stellar mass black holes. So I always like to say that with the first discovery there were many gold medals when this was happening, the Olympics were happening. So we had the first direct detection of gravitational waves. The first detection of a binary black hole that merges within the age of the universe. The first observation of stellar mass black holes whose masses are greater than 25 solar masses. And if you talk to an astrophysicist, he tells you that if you want to make such large uh, mass objects, then the stellar wind has to be much, much weak. And if the stellar wind you want it to be weak, then the metallicity of the medium has to be much, much smaller. So immediately you can see that the first discovery is already telling us about the metallicity of the environment in which this particular object was really formed. Using these three events, we estimate that per gigaparsec cube of the universe, every year you should see from 9 to 240 binary merger events. This uncertainty is basically because of the uncertainty in astrophysics which we have today. There are so many such events that all these events can produce a stochastic background of gravitational waves and when the gravity wave detectors like LIGO reach their desired sensitivity, maybe we may be able to look for this stochastic background. I always find it very amazing that this binary system really emitted when it was 1.3 billion years ago and at that time on the earth transition was happening from a single cell to a multicellular form of life. So the first discovery, LIGO is an acronym for the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. They never wanted, they were never satisfied to call themselves just a gravity wave detector and you would agree that already with the first discovery, the O in LIGO is well sort of justified. Which is why, for example, the community is now very, very enthusiastic. They are planning about the next level of upgrades which they want to do. So advanced LIGO would be upgraded to what is called as A+. Then the next generation detectors are called Voyager, Einstein Telescope, <coughs> Cosmic Explorer and so on. And for the third generation, the basic science drivers would be study of extreme gravity 
extreme matter because we are going to study neutron stars, so matter at its extreme. And eventually you will be able to do cosmology using these particular objects, so you will be able to also talk about cosmic history. Finally, all the projects depend on people and I just want to end by talking about the people who were involved in this long odyssey. Ray Weiss, who basically thought about detecting gravitation wave by using laser interferometers, one of the first. He started in 1972 by a very obscure publication of the MIT. And then, this is how he began, and this is Ray Weiss today, almost 80 years old. Kip Thorne, when he was a professor at Caltech, when he began his career, Kip Thorne, the scriptwriter of Interstellar as he is today. These were the people who got MIT and Caltech to commit to this particular project. All the techniques which I told you, these advanced techniques in the laser interferometry was through Ron Drever. And then, of course, you know, you have to get the funding agencies on board. And we were very lucky that Ray Isaacson, one of the people from General Relativity, was at NSF and he shepherded basically made sure that the project got the approvals required at the NSF. The project was defended by Robbie Wo, so he was also the first director of the LIGO labs. But then, till all this particular time, we were just a bunch of general relativists who just did GBNU, GBNU, and then a bunch of experimental lab physicists who really didn't know how to pull out a big project. That was really done by Barry Barish, who brought into the search for gravitational waves, the project requirement of a collaboration. So the LIGO scientific collaboration which really made the discovery was really the handiwork of Barry Barry. So you can see here that this kind of activity really involves multiple talents and it is because of people who came in with this particular talents, grew a generation and probably the next generation that this discovery really became possible. But the whole question is, what are these gravitational waves we are seeing and where are they coming from in this car? With the first discovery, we really had the Louisiana discover, uh, detector saw the signal first and then the Hanford detector seven milliseconds later. So when you reconstruct the location of the source in the sky, you know that it was somewhere in this region in the sky. This region in the sky is something like 590 square degrees. But even then, our colleagues in electromagnetic astronomy followed these particular sources and they found that there is no electromagnetic counterpart corresponding to this gravity wave emission. So if you had, for example, the Virgo detector and you try to locate sources in the sky, in these parts of the sky, you can locate them rather well. But in this parts of the sky, you cannot do that. If you move the second Hanford detector to India, for example, anywhere in India, all these error ellipses become very small and that essentially is the rationale for LIGO India. If LIGO India was functioning when the discovery was made, rather than having 600 square degrees in the sky, the source could be localized to about 5 square degrees. And therefore you can see, if you try to do electromagnetic follow-up, you will be much more efficient. And that essentially is the motivation for the LIGO India project. As I told you, we really had a legacy of gravity wave research in source modeling, data analysis, but the idea was to move our participation in gravity wave experiments and become part of the global gravity wave network. This is why the Indigo Consortium was set up in 2009. We made the LIGO India proposal in 2011 and were hoping to get our approval by 2012. Unfortunately, it required something which happened 1.3 billion years ago to have the approval in 2016 and we are hoping that LIGO India will come online in 2024. So if everything goes well, this will be the global network of gravity wave detectors. We have the two LIGO detectors, the Virgo detector, a detector in Japan which is a remarkable detector which is being built underground, which is going to use cryogenics. This probably will come on by 2020 and our detector by 2024. And then, though I focused on only neutron star, neutron star and black hole, black hole kind of binaries, there are other sources we can look for. For example, if there is going to be a supernova, we will definitely be able to see the gravitational wave emission from that. 
If you have a neutron star which is sort of spinning, if there is a small dimple on a neutron star, it puts out gravitational waves which are very weak. We can probably look for them. And of course, the Big Bang itself, from the Big Bang there could be gravitational waves. Eventually, over the next 20, 30 years, we can look for them. Astronomy began with Galileo's telescope, but then today we look at the universe in many multiple wave bands. And what is important is that gravitational waves also span such two decades. I talked about the gravitational wave detectors on the Earth, but already we are talking about gravitational wave detectors in space, the LISA detector, which will be able to detect gravitational waves in the millihertz range. Gravitational waves from supermassive black hole binaries will, are being looked at by pulsar timing arrays and eventually we will build a dedicated instrument to look for gravitational waves from inflation itself. So what is important is that uh, new astronomy is really getting, uh, you know, is coming into being and the excitement basically is because of the fact that today if you try to look at the universe by using electromagnetic radiation, you can look at it when it's about 100,000 years old. By neutral rose probably you can look at the first second of the existence of the universe. But by gravitational waves you can really go back to when the universe really came into being and that essentially is why over the next let's say 50 years we will try to get there. So to conclude, gravitational waves from this first event change the separation between two test masses by this small amount. And therefore, with advanced LIGO, we have achieved the technology to make a direct detection of gravitational waves. It has taken 100 years, but we have got there. We also have corresponding progress in the two-body problem in general relativity. The related data analysis to detect gravitational waves, characterize them, and also begin to test the general theory of relativity. The first detection involved black hole binaries. I would like to call them, we knew they existed, but we had not seen them before. The second observational run of LIGO has already started in November and they are continuing to sort of take uh, data and by the second half, by somewhere in March, maybe Virgo will also join us. Now the important point is that you hope to see about one black hole binary per month and eventually when you get to design sensitivity, you would scale it by a factor of three and therefore you would almost see one black hole event per day. So you can see that what we are getting to is a very vibrant astronomy. So the question you ask is, we wanted to start neutron star, look for neutron star binaries. They are actually our known knowns, but we have not yet seen them. Neutron star black holes should sort of exist. Again, they fall in the category of known unknowns. But the whole question is, would there be unknown unknowns as nature has always provided us? And the other point is that a major revolution in astronomy is around the corner. This facility in India has an opportunity to play a key role and because of the fact that it will really be a critical element in this global network for gravitational wave astronomy. Already people are talking about multi-band gravity astronomy. For example, if the LISA detector was on, we would have known that this event in September was going to happen because LISA is in the millihertz range. So just a few years prior to the coalescence, it will pick up that particular signal. So this is the excitement. And currently in 2018, LISA is being considered for funding. And if it happens, probably by 2030 or 2034, it will basically happen. Let me go back to 1919, November 7, in the miserable time of the First World War when suddenly the eclipse test of GR hit the newspapers and after that Einstein and general relativity really became overnight sensations. After that Einstein's aura has not abated even though it's a century later. We are all very fortunate because according to me February 11, 2016 was just like November 7, 1919 for our generation and obviously at the centenary of the general relativity and gravitational waves Einstein probably would not want anything more. It hit completely the newspapers, for example. There was this cartoon in the New York Times. Was that you I heard just now, or was it two black holes colliding? Two birds talking to each other. Our own Amul ad, uh, ad in, the news, in the New York subway. 
and even a dress design using the gravity wave. This is our spokesperson Gabriela Gonzalez and a tie looking at the gravitational wave discovery. So it really captured the public imagination. So I think that Einstein deserves some music because he loved music and I don't know whether this will play but if it doesn't play, thank you for your attention. Here for what the gravitational signal looks like.